Would you rather go raw vegan again for a year or lose all your money? Lose all my money. <laughs> I knew you would say that. I'm serious. I value my health and I don't want kidney stones and gout again. Like, f the raw vegan diet. <laughs> it, it was so harmful for me and I still regret doing that. It, it is so bad for you. So my real goal, I don't want to live to 180. I want to live so that I can die at a time and by a method of my choosing. That's freedom. It doesn't matter how you look, it's how you feel, because the way you feel can change everything else, right? Like it's yeah. the starting point. I lived much of my life with chronic fatigue syndrome and not having energy is hell. That's the no. whole idea behind biohacking is you get to choose your energy and you can choose the body, but the body follows the energy. I wanna get to the reason behind 40 Years of Zen. How did you okay. start it and what's the science behind it? Did you work on that at 40 Years of Zen? I did, oh my God, you're making me cry, but I guess it's still there, you know, just- Some of it. Yeah, is it not being enough? Or is it an imposter thing? Because it can be mm, either or. I think it's both, but I think it's just like never being treated seriously. It's just really interesting that like the ultimate biohacks, like having better orgasms, knowing how to forgive. It's not something that we learn in there, school. There's you know? a connection between those, by the way. What's oh, yeah? holding you back from life-changing orgasms? Not being able to allow yourself to feel emotions. Yeah. Hi, my name is Aggie and this is Biohacking Bestie. the one-stop shop for a modern queen where you can find biohacking courses, self-growth courses, and where you can find the most incredible community of women so you can hit all of your biohacking goals and beyond. Hello, beautiful humans. Welcome to Biohacking Bestie. And today we are hosting Dave Asprey, one of my favorite biohackers. <laughs> and Isn't that your favorite biohacker? I am. You are, yeah. Just one of? No, no, you are my favorite Thanks biohacker and the OG biohacker. So <laughs> thank you so much for you know letting me host you again because i have so many questions that i didn't get to ask last time you were here that'll be fun but before we dive in i want to play a little game with you because we all need a little bit of more play so you ready yes this is called this or that you can only pick one okay bulletproof coffee or grass-fed steak grass-fed steak nad or nmn nad red light therapy or infrared sauna Red light therapy. That's a tough one. Glucose level or HRV? HRV. Aura ring or whoop? Aura. Prebiotic or probiotic? <laughs> Some of them are hard. That one's postbiotic. I'm a country. Okay. Um, bone broth <laughs> or collagen? Collagen. Cold plunge or sauna? Cold plunge. All right. And then this one's going to be even harder. This one's called Would You Rather? Would you rather drink oat milk latte or a kale smoothie? Oat milk latte. Not drink Bulletproof for a year or not having grass-fed steak for a year? And I'd have to not drink Bulletproof for a year because steak is so fundamental to reality. Perfect. Live without 40 years of zen or live without upgrade labs? <laughs> Honestly, I would have to say live without 40 years of zen. No, sorry. Live without upgrade labs because... Upgrade Labs saves so much time on, on the exercise and all these other things, but I don't know another way to do the gratitude and forgiveness, like the really deep work to be able to sit in, in the, the things that I sit in and be mm -hmm. sane and grounded without that. So there's a deeper, bigger field from Zen, but I would like to do both because Labs saves me so much time each week. Yeah. Um, would you rather have no gadgets or no supplements? Mm. Probably no gadgets. Would you rather go raw vegan again for a year or lose all your money? Lose all my money. <laughs> I knew you would say that. <laughs> Dude, I'm serious. I value my health and I don't want kidney stones and gout again. Like, fuck the raw vegan diet. <laughs> it, it was so harmful for me and I still, still regret doing that. It, it is so bad for you. So you would rather lose all your money? Seriously, I, love that I can make more money, but you don't get your health back. Like right. it it's taken years to recover the damage from being a raw vegan. Like, don't do that, guys. If you're thinking about it, there's no moral superiority to starving yourself while poisoning yourself with plants and telling yourself it's healthy and good for animals. It is none of those things. So don't do it. There. <laughs> was that, that, was, oh, that was a vegan soapbox. It was okay. <laughs> Great. All right. And one more. One more. Because I was like, I knew you were going like, to say something. So we, this round is called Biohack or Bullshit. You can okay. either call it, it's a biohack or other it's bullshit. I, I tend to not do debunking, takedown stuff, but I'll, okay. I'll make an exception for you. Um, grounding mats. That's a biohack. Tread, treadmill desk. 
It's not that effective, but it is a it is a biohack. So. Tr- uh, coffee enemas. You like to ride right in the middle, don't you? <laughs> um, I'll just say cool your. I just co- want all these views okay. right away from the stars. Like <laughs> cool, cool your coffee off first is all I can say. On that. Um, <laughs> rectal ozone administration. That is the best biohack ever. I just did it recently, and I, I was just like, did I it right th- before this. <laughs> <laughs> It is so good, though. <laughs> it's, it's the best. It literally brought my brain back when I had toxic mold for uh-huh. years. It's what restored me from chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, so for those of that don't understand what that means, you basically uh, go to a lovely lady or a man, and they put ozone up your ass, basically. I, I have a machine. I just do it at home. You do it at home? I've done Instagram lives while I'm doing it. I'm like, I see this hose that's going into my pants. Like, it's hashtag reverse fart. And you're putting a small <laughs> amount of ozone gas. And you can do it at home. And it... It can turn your mitochondria on. It literally turned my brain on when nothing else would work. No way. I was still working in Silicon Valley, and I would just have the worst brain fog. And the first day I did it, I got my brain back for two minutes, and the next day it was three minutes. So it's like weightlifting for your antioxidant systems. I, I cannot recommend it enough for people who are just like nothing works. It'll fix you. Because I did, because I hope to restore my gut after getting a massive parasite, like, mm-hmm. um, you know, in Bali. But... Apart from parasite, what else can we take the ozone therapy for? It works for any mitochondrial dysfunction, toxic mold, Lyme, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, long. And then there's a word you just don't say online anymore because then they censor you for it. But that word starts with a C. It sounds like video. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know that word? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it works really well for that. It turns out. But why is it so, like, you know, considering the U.S. that it's a very alternative technique that might be bullshit? What's the uh, reason behind it? It competes with big pharma. Yeah. Uh, in Cuba, where they don't have any big pharma, <laughs> they've done so much research on ozone, it's ridiculous. So ozone therapy is something that will kill almost any bacteria. So you can use it to treat infections that won't go away on your skin. And when you breathe it, it's bad for you. But when you use it intravenously or rectally or vaginally, ozone therapy will challenge your mitochondria so that they realize they have to make more of their own antioxidants called SOD and glutathione. And what it does is it takes mitochondria that are kind of running at half power and it wakes them up and it makes them run at full power. So it's kind of like a kick in the pants. And that's why it feels so good. Yeah, it's it's why it feels so good and your brain turns on. But What's really going on there, it's not just that oxygen is getting in because there's lots of ways to do that. It's that the cells wake up and it's almost like if you do a really heavy squat, your body's like, oh, I should grow some quads and a butt because I might have to do that again. Ozone is a heavy squat for your mitochondria. Like, dang, I better, I better get a little bit more ripped here and get rid of the weak ones. So over time, you really improve systemically. Wow. So how often would you recommend someone does it? It depends on how sick you are. Uh, for me, it was rectally every day okay. for more than a year. Right? And now I do it kind of as needed. If your gut is off, and you should know because it smells bad, then you can do that. It'll fix your gut bacteria pretty rapidly. If you've been traveling, you can do it. If you're getting sick, you can do it. And after that, if everything's working great and you have your energy back, once a week. Okay, amazing. It, one great thing about being in Bali is that it's so available. It costs $50 to do like both blood and rectal. Oh, that's cheap for blood. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, rectal should be like five bucks. Like you go to a doctor, they fill a bag and give you a hose in a bag. You go to the bathroom, you squeeze the bag, it goes in. But at home, if you have a machine, they run about a thousand bucks. And you have a little tank of oxygen. Welding oxygen works fine. And then magically that'll last for years that amount of oxygen no way. and then you just kind of whenever you feel like it you put the hose in and turn it on and the one good you when you did say farting in reverse it is one thing to like holding a fart it's like basically what you need to do because it's like you do it and then you're like oh my god i have to go to the bathroom and mm-hmm. you're not supposed to let it out yeah and perfectionists will say we'll do a coffee enema first and you don't have to clean everything out you literally like just do it And most of it absorbs through the colon into the blood. You get the systemic benefits. And it is such a minor thing to do. Like the hose is smaller than a pencil. Like it doesn't hurt. There's no weirdness about it at all. No, it's great. All right, perfect. Uh, What about eating clay? Biohack or bullshit? Oh, it's it's a biohack. I've been recommending that since my fertility book, my first book. Oh, wow. 
and home I, i'm gonna butcher this word i'm so sorry this is the the immigrant in me i'm like how min thick therapy <laughs> the eating Helmand worms therapy. Well, how do you say it Hellman therapy Hellman therapy Hel there's a Hellman th with a th so it's not bullshit at all in fact i was the first one i did i did rat tapeworm eggs in in maybe 2012 and then a couple years later i did pig whipworm eggs on stage at my biohacking conference so these are just probiotics but they're big probiotics and the idea is that when these are present which they always have been throughout all of history the ones that are compatible with humans i chose those two species because they can't reproduce so you get one dose and then they go away but What it does is it sends a signal to your gut to heal itself. And I was on a path of healing my gut because it had been dysfunctional since I was a kid. Yeah. And I don't think that they made a huge difference for me, but I know many people who cured IBS and Crohn's and even autism-like symptoms have gone down dramatically. So they can wow. regulate your immune system. I would do a fecal matter transplant now before I would do pig whipworm eggs, but I would do both if my gut wasn't so freaking great right now. I like I love how my body works. Oh, I, I feel like gut is still like my, something I'm working towards because you know I grew up with my parents, you know, it's like, oh, you have a headache, just take this antibiotic. Sure. You know, that was like my go-to for everything, right? So I grew up just having a really like challenged gut, you know, I would get sick all the time, I would get bloated. And so, I'm still on the journey of like rebuilding it, but I'm very curious to see how would you build your gut? Oh, wow. Let's well, start with okay. some simple techniques and some really weird ones. Okay. So we, we share this in common. I took antibiotics just about every month for 15 years as a kid. It's because I would get strep throat all the time. Like every month it would come back. And then when I had my tonsils out, which is generally a bad idea, I would get sinus infections every month. It turns out the cause of that was toxic mold in the environment. Well, the bacteria in your sinuses figure out there's mold. They form a biofilm to protect themselves from the mold. The biofilm is what strep throat is. So once I realized that's what was going on, I could change my environment, get the mold out. I don't typically get sinus infections. It's incredibly rare, like once every five years or something when I deserve it because I stayed up for three nights at Burning Man or something. Okay, fine. <laughs> Right. So I feel like everyone gets the Burning Man flu after you're done because you just like you push yourself too hard and you come back to the reality and body's like, no, no, no. Right. You need to chill. I, I've gotten a little better now because I know how to use uh, stress hormones, exogenous stress hormones so you can manage short bursts of way more than you're supposed to do without paying for it later. But it's Ooh. work. So how do you fix your gut? Well, number one, you might need to go on a carnivore diet. You could also do a long fast if you want to. And the reason to do a carnivore diet is you are probably growing SIBO if you have lots of problems. Yeah. This is small intestine bacteria overgrowth and certainly something I had along with candida. And when that happens, not feeding anything is pretty good. You may need to do grapefruit seed extract or colloidal silver to sort of kill stuff that's, that's going on in your gut. So a bit of a reset. So fasting or only meat can do that for you. And when you're fasting, do water and salt. You can do coffee too, because it feeds the good guys in your gut, the polyphenols. Or tea, if you must. You want to be like weak, because everyone knows coffee is stronger than tea. Unless yeah. you're British, in which case, well, if you drink the tea instead of the coffee, you're still weak. Sorry, my friends. Okay, I can say this. Jacob have, is not here, so I it's have okay. British DNA anyway. I'm just, I'm just kidding, guys. Drink your tea. It's just not as good as coffee. <laughs> All right. So, um, back to the gut. Uh, Next. So carnival diet because like i'm actually curious mm -hmm. like is mm -hmm. it a biohack or bullshit because i love carnival i just personally don't think that would work for me long term oh no it's not a long-term diet like do it for a short period of time like a month so i tested what we now call the carnivore diet when i created the bulletproof diet and the book came out in i think 2014 but people have lost millions of pounds on the diet it was because i had been a raw vegan and it will trash you and then i was a carnivore And I did it for mm, about three or four months. And I started, I'm like, this is the best thing ever. I'm just eating meat. Because before the modern carnivore influencers were out there, there were a couple really weird esoteric guys, including one guy who only ate like spoiled meat and raw meat. Like there's all sorts of crazy <laughs> corners of the internet. And I tried all that except the spoiled meat because that's just a bad idea. So <laughs> uh, like I said, I'm a biohacker. So 
once you realize that you feel great on meat, just like you'll feel great for the first little while on a raw vegan diet, you're like, this is the way. And then you do it until it profoundly breaks you and you hit a wall. And you won't know yeah. the wall is coming until you hit it. So on the carnivore diet, my prediction was, you guys are mostly going to find out that you need some carbs. And probably the guy who I think is the most flexible about this is Paul Saladino, who's a friend. And he started out only meat, and now he's like, well, meat and like, I ate some fruit, and I ate some of this. And the Bulletproof Diet, let's say you do meat, full fat dairy, if you can handle it, or full mm -hmm. fat butter, and the meat's always grass fed, and there's reasons for that. And you can do some carbs. White rice is an okay carb. Uh, sweet potatoes for some people, and then some fruit, but not lots of fruit. And what you end up doing is, you end up with the same thing, low plant toxins, mostly meat. But if you wanna fix your gut, do one month of just meat and salt. And the reason you do that is to get rid of bacteria you don't need. Do some intermittent fasting if you want in there. That's gonna help a lot, maybe oregano oil. So this is a reset. Mm -hmm. Then you start taking prebiotics. And the ones that I like best are acacia gum and larch arabinogalactin is another one. And Easy to remember ones. guys, so don't worry. I, I put together a Rolls formula. Rolls off the tongue so yeah. easily. <laughs> <laughs> These are all tree saps, surprisingly. Oh, but, no way. Yeah. But that's like, so explain it real quick, prebiotics and probiotics and okay. postbiotics, because you actually mentioned postbiotic, and most people are all like, right. wait, what is that? I've never heard that word before. Okay. I, I've learned that from you as well. Oh, cool. So think of it like this. You eat some stuff, okay? That is what the bacteria in your gut are going to eat. That's pretty straightforward, right? So that would be the prebiotic. This is food for your probiotics. Probiotics are bacteria that you take to change the composition of what's in your gut. And then postbiotics, they're what bacteria make that are beneficial. So basically, food for the bacteria, the bacteria, and bacteria poop. <laughs> you can take all three. And postbiotics are fascinating. It's one of the new categories of biohacking. Because when you take those, strangely, it usually causes you to grow more bacteria that are going to poop those out. And they send a very strong signal to you. And the most, probably the most famous one that I wrote about in my aging book is spermidine. And you couldn't yeah. buy it when I wrote the book, but now you can. And now it's almost everywhere. It's like the new, oh, yeah. 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 It's it's one of those things like the anti-aging promise of spermidine is so strong, but there, without being able to buy it, you could only take a probiotic that would make spermidine. Now you can just take spermidine, and when you do, it causes the probiotics to grow in your gut. And I all I know about spermidine that you're meant to have it after your last meal of the day because it kind of like improves with fasting. You can have it anytime. You can? It's a fasting mimetic. You can mm -hmm. take it during a fast, but even if you take it with a meal, it still causes changes genetically, epigenetic changes that wow. fasting does. So I take mine usually in the morning with a big handful of supplements. Oh, how many? How many supplements? I do about 150 a day, so it's probably 90 in the morning. Nine, and you don't get a stomach ache. Why would I get a stomach ache? Because that's a lot of supplements. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Um, if I take them just with water and not enough water in an empty stomach, mm -hmm. but it also depends what you're taking. So some supplements are going to give you like a really upset stomach. So don't take those. Right. And let's see, which book was this in my fasting book? I called them the barfy four. Yeah. Remember and that? you said the vitamin B, which I didn't realize. And then yeah. I stopped taking them. I was like, oh, actually that was the, like one of the reasons yeah. I was just getting so nauseous in the morning. I'm like, oh, this sucks. A B vitamin will make you hurl if you take it on an empty stomach. So there's that. And then there's fish oil for a lot of people. And then sometimes minerals. And what was the fourth one? I don't remember what the fourth one was. I have your book, we can look yeah, it up. Yeah, I'd have to look it up. But <laughs> I went through and I tested them all. That's the one that makes you puke. So the other thing here is it shouldn't be that hard. And you could also wait till your first meal. If I was having butter and MCT oil in my coffee, you can take almost anything with that and it'll just absorb. All right, so out of the 150, how <laughs> many do you think are like the absolute necessary for, for well, a person. do you want to live past 180? Um, like what's your goal? To have a very long play span and health span, but I don't know if I want to live very long. Hold on, you want a very long lifespan and play span, but you don't want to live very long. Health you sound span. conflicted. Yeah, no. So I, I don't. <laughs> I want my health span and my play span to be as long as possible, okay. but I don't know if I want to like. So, so when do you want to, so let's assume. So I said like 85. Okay, so let's assume that you're going to be healthy and able to play until you die. Yeah. They're just like straight up, as good as you are now or better. Now, how long do you want to live? Mm, it's funny to say, but I would probably say it really depends 
on whether my partner is a biohacker or not because I have to be single past my 80 and do another 100 by myself. I'd be like, oh. Well, it seems kind of limiting because it is. if I, you looked and felt like you were now and you were 100, couldn't you find another partner? That's true. I mean, yes, but that sounds like or, or, or like, or like three or something. four of them. I mean, you have a lot of energy, right? Well, that is an option, but you're lo- totally getting me in trouble. Can we just cut it out for I'm Jacob? I'm kidding. You. I'm kidding. But no, but honestly, they're like, what is this? Because like for a lot of people, it might sound intimidating. And this idea, oh, my hunting is expensive. So what's like okay. the core of what you take? What is it that's like, uh-huh. oh, it's kind of cool to have. And then it's like, this is like okay. extra, extra. Oh. I'm Dave Asprey. I'm kind of just like loading up. I'll, I'll answer it for you. I, there's one thing I have to tell you, though, first. I, I ran an anti-aging nonprofit group in Silicon Valley in the late 90s, early 2000s, where all of the members, all of the board of directors were in their 70s, 80s, a few in their 90s, with functioning brains, really working hard to stay young and stay healthy. They were functional. There is no one, when they're 84, says, gee, I'm glad I decided that I would die at 85, even if they're healthy. All of them, like, I would like a few more good years. I want to see my grandkids. Like, like, literally, when we're young, we don't see that. And I'm just so grateful. I was so sick in my 20s. I learned from my elders, like two or three generations past me, and they taught me biohacking. And I watched oh, them true. cope with end of life. And the bottom line is no one chooses to die at the end of their life unless they're done. And those people, when they choose to go, they go in peace, surrounded by family, and it's not a horrible death. It's actually almost as as sacred as being born. So my real goal, I don't want to live to 180. I want to live so that I can die at a time and by a method of my choosing. That's freedom. That's very true. All right, let's talk about I, the supplements that give you the energy for yeah. that. Okay. Because they, they, <clears throat> they did a study recently and they you know, asked people, like, would you rather be skinny or have energy? And this is the first time ever when people said, actually, I would rather have more energy than look good. Me too. I lived much of my life with chronic fatigue syndrome and not having energy is hell. That's the whole idea behind biohacking is you get to choose your energy and you can choose the body, but the body follows the energy. Yeah. Like it's not the main focus of biohacking because I was trying to figure out like, what's the difference between biohacking and mainstream like fitness advice? It's like, it doesn't matter how you look, it's how you feel because, because the way you feel can change everything else, right? Like it's the starting point. And a lot of mainstream advice isn't focused on the fact that your body responds to your environment. So changing the environment around you and inside of you to give you control, like your goal may be someday, you know, I, I want to be really fertile and have healthy babies. That's an entirely That's different goal. That's my goal right now. We can talk right. about it. Can okay, we, we can do a whole episode it? on that. I mean, I wrote a whole yeah. book on it, right? Yeah, I have it um, as well. And so let's do it. <laughs> so, all right, we'll, we'll do a special baby episode. I'd love to. And But we need to do it before I get pregnant, which is soon. So Okay, got it. So we'll, we'll do it soon. Yeah. <laughs> Come back next week. <laughs> <laughs> next week. There we go. All right. And making plans. The The idea, though, is that your goal there is so different than someone's like, I want to be a fitness competitor. Or I want my brain to work really well. I'm happy to be 10 pounds overweight, but I need to be able to sleep four hours a night because I'm starting a company. By the way, that's what I did for Bulletproof. I slept four hours a night for 18 months. And I was a vice president at a publicly traded company making a quarter million dollars a year when I started Bulletproof. And when I quit my day job, I could replace my salary with Bulletproof. Wow. Because I was able to biologically actually lose weight and have my energy. It was hard, but I did it. I don't recommend it for people, but it's possible. So that's a very different goal than being fertile. You cannot, those are, those are yeah. not compatible, yeah. right? So biohacking, you choose your state. The other one is mainstream health. You want to be healthy and no one knows what it is. So they think it's Brussels sprouts and kale and it's dumb. They don't, no one even knows what healthy is. That's why Upgrade Labs exists. Because, like, let's measure what your health is when you define your goal, and then we we'll use tech to get you there. Yeah. It's so what really annoys me is that like these fitness trainers are like, "Hey, this is the diet that I, you know, promote and really works for me. I haven't had my period in ten years, which is like my fifth vital sign. But you know, my diet's <laughs> great. I'm like, that's the first indication to yes. like run away if you haven't had your period in for so long. Like, clearly you're, you know, you don't have enough nutrients. It, so I was it, like, no. <laughs> it actually hurts my heart really when I see women who have been taught not to nourish themselves because there's different sources of nourishment. There's food, right? And then there's food timing. And then there's also having peace in your environment around you. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's a physical touch and then there's intimacy. And these are all forms of nourishment, even community. 
And if you are taught to cut off food and electricity and you just live in a constant state of hunger, it's really hard to express all the other parts of it, right? And then yeah. your hormones don't work. And, and it's, it's a form of, of cruelty that we built into our expectations for women. And yeah. we can break that. And I've seen so many, just like you have so many women who under eat calories because mm -hmm. calories are somehow bad for you, even though calories are what your energy is made out of. And they're tired and it's hard to manage your emotions. Mm. Same for men. If we don't have enough energy, we're going to yell at people. Cause I think we don't even, do and we've been tired for so long that we don't even remember what it's yeah. like to not feel tired. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. Second, the only re cause I was like, you know, wrote a book. Uh, and I was like, part of me, it's like, I can just, I've been sending people to your, all of your books. I'm like, it's already out there. But I realized that what I can offer for women is like my first kind of experience, which is like getting to know everything that you're teaching. And, you know, I'm going to be an A student on biohacking and do it just even better than they asked for you. Look at me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go fast harder and, you know, uh, eat even more meat and whatnot. And clearly it, it's too much. And I think for yeah. us women, we we learn a diet and we just want to be super good at it and it's just like combining the biohacking with the bio slacking and just realizing that you need to let go because the for us we need to feel nourished we need to feel safe and protected and it's important right like we're, we is. don't thrive by challenge we thrive by thrive by nourishment in a way you you've, you say it so elegantly it's not about doing it perfectly. And we have taught women societally in all sorts of pernicious, mean ways where either it's too, you're too much or you're not enough. So you can never actually find the middle because no matter where you are, you could be a little bit more in either direction. So you're constantly caught in that and that doesn't feel safe. So no. then how do we make it so you have so much energy that you have the presence of mind to step back and look at that and say, this is nonsense. Like I'm good enough right now. And today I'm gonna eat a donut because it's what I really wanted. And I know tomorrow I might be bloated and have acne or whatever, but it was worth it. And to just, I'm not a bad person because I did that. I just chose to do it because I, I wanted to. And I think it's all, the the really is the choice, right? Because it's like, I used to live in the in, in a body that felt like having a donut is no choice. I had to yeah. have it. Oh, me too. So it was like, there. so I didn't have a choice. My was, body was, was like, it where donuts? I what was your like kryptonite? Oh my god, so many um, oat milk lattes was like. Oat milk uh, lattes. I was chocolate was, chip cookies, man. Those things are oh, really? crack. Yeah. No, I mean, I have like I just like like very salty like chips and stuff. But anyways, so I was um, yeah, I didn't have a choice, and I think biohacking allows me to have a choice. I have a donut from a place of choice of like, I just want to have it. And without the guilt afterwards, which I think for a lot of women, it's just like they get so obsessed and so stressed and they don't have permission to just relax. Can, can I make a confession? Oh my God. I'm always scared when you do, but sure. All right. I, Are we ready to be? No, it's not that bad. I just got back from uh, Turkey and Dubai. Uh, and I was over there for I don't know, 10 or 12 days. I was doing a, a workshop in Turkey, like four intense biohacking days with a small group of people at a big resort. Turkey is the home of baklava. European oh, wheat. Oh, that is, that is my kryptonite. It, it's a soft wheat. American wheat is hard wheat. And it doesn't have glyphosate in it. So I can eat it and I don't get bad effects from it. So I was like, how often am I here? So <laughs> I ate a kilogram over those 12 days of baklava, I took, I took gluten digesting enzymes each time and I felt fine. I didn't gain a pound of weight. I did my normal amount of exercise. My metabolism can handle sugar like that. And I did it after I had a steak each time and I would do it again. Would I do that every day of my life? No, because it would, it would accelerate my aging. I feel zero guilt about this. It was totally a choice. It was freaking awesome. And I would do it again. Amazing. I was, one of my questions was actually, um, if there was one food that was actually bulletproof approved which is not right now which one would you and what would i want to be bulletproof yeah. approved would it be bak you know what for me it's bread yeah whole a good old like whole sourdough, sourdough. Yeah. yeah that would be good but what, i think i might want croissants more than that ah uh, like true. croissants are really good and they're hard to make with gluten-free i've tried so yeah. hard yeah they're not as and especially like yeah the, the other uh, one would be cheesecake cheesecake you can have a keto cheesecake kind of healthy you, from exactly. everyone the, 
it's it's, oh, yeah. it's not as good, but you, you can, can get a croissant. You can't really get a good croissant. That would be. It's impossible to do a croissant. Yeah, you're right. You can do it. And in fact, I've published recipes for like gelatin based cheesecakes. The problem is for so many people, dairy protein is kryptonite. And it turns, like it does for me, into morphine in the brain. It's called caseomorphine. And it makes you tired. It gives you cravings. It makes you want to eat more of it. And it's just not good for you. But if you're someone who does digest dairy in a good way, and it's grass-fed dairy, which has the right proteins, it's actually a good source of protein. It's just so, there's such a big, a big break there. And I have a little hint for you, too, about dairy. Women who eat low-fat dairy products, like skim milk, mm -hmm. the stuff that they, they powdered milk they put everywhere. Are crazy. <laughs> well, 75% worse chances of getting pregnant. Wow. And women who eat full-fat dairy are 27% more likely to be able to get pregnant. Wow. Right? So there's um, pregnant than just average people. So there's a big, I, was, I think a 2007 study, but there's a, a big effect from dairy protein versus dairy fat. And I would just say dairy fat is generally good for almost everyone. And dairy protein, all who knows, right? So what's the best way? Because I, I love that we're saying this, right? So it's like this, this idea of like, well, we've been having bread for 10,000s of years and same with milk. How come like we can't have it anymore? It's, it's simple, but could you explain to people who are right. listening right now why this is a big deal and why we're scared of gluten? <laughs> okay. So for milk, I, we just talked about it. It's what we feed the cows and it's what we do to the milk. But so grass-fed dairy fat is one of the healthiest things you can possibly do. And we've known this for 10,000 years of Ayurveda. It's called ghee. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's really funny when I give talks in India, they're like, why is this white guy telling me to do what my grandmother told me to do? And I'm like, sorry guys. I, like, I just looked at the science and they think it's funny. Yeah. So, but, but also pasteurization, bread. right? So yeah. what happens? Well, pasteurization what? is, is a problem, except you were going to cook it in cheesecake anyway. Like cooked milk wasn't a problem for so long. So pasteurization is part of it. It's homogenization. That's the real devil. And this is when they take high high pressure and they force the milk through a screen which breaks up the droplets of fat until they're so tiny they just enter your cells. Normal milk is globs of fat that you digest. So it makes it so you can't use the fat and it makes it so the proteins are damaged and they're the wrong kinds of protein anyway. And it's so annoying that the homogenization is only being done so that it looks good and it's consistent in the packaging which is a, a just a cosmetic issue in it, a way. Yeah, it's of limited value, right? Yeah. So cream on top milk, good to go. Um, and then Wheat. gluten, yeah. Okay. So in societies that eat grain, especially gluten, what you see over time from the historical record, their, their spine straightens out in a non-beneficial way. It becomes flat. Their upper palate shrinks. They get folic acid deficiencies, and their height decreases. They get cavities. So here's the thing about Wait, am wheat. I short because of bread? Yes, oh. in part. <laughs> Your people have been eating bread for a long time, have they not? Yeah, yes. There, there you go. Damn so, it. Mom, why? <laughs> and it turns out it's not just bread. It's, it's a high starch diet. So yeah. look at Peru, where they invented potatoes and corn. Like the average Peruvian is like four foot nine. Okay, it's slightly <laughs> higher than that. But uh, when, you, when you go down there and you realize, okay, a carbohydrate-based diet will sustain you versus starvation, but it does not create tall, strong, biggest-brained, densest-boned people. The Vikings are like meat, meat and fish, and nothing else grows up there. What, what are they going to do? Eat moss? <laughs> a couple berries. Sea moss, like in Erwan, you know, like the sea moss. That stuff is so bad for you. Ugh. You don't like it. You know what carrageenan is? Yes. Is it? Sea moss is vegan carrageenan. It shreds your gut. It's the number one source of carrageenan. Oh, I yeah. That. See, what I learned as a vegan chef is that vegans will torture food to try and make it taste like real food, but it's still not real food no matter what you do. So sea moss is the same as when you take that silk, tofu, gunk, milky stuff, and you look on the back, it says carrageenan, and you eat it and it makes you fart a lot, that's sea moss. And they go, but, but it has 94 minerals in it. It doesn't matter if something has minerals, if it also punches you in the face when you drink it. Like you have to look at the downside, which is yeah. it shreds your gut lining and pokes holes in your gut. It's sort of, you ever see the movie Idiocracy? No. Okay, you have to see this. Really? It's a movie about how the dumbest person alive today gets frozen, wakes up 200 years in the future, and he's the smartest person alive. And everyone is starving to death because... Are they all vegan? No. 
because they're <laughs> spraying crops with Gatorade instead of water. And he goes, why are you doing that? And they go, because electrolytes. And they keep doing it. Uh, yeah. It's like untested assumptions. We, we just believe it to be true and we keep doing it. I think that another thing that you have trained me to, <coughs> to uh, you have trained me to look at a full picture and kind of make an informed decision, right? Because every time it was just like, okay, this is, you know, you look at, I don't know, a pepper and you're like, oh, it has this many calories and this many vitamins. And you're like, well, what about anti-nutrients, right? And so we can make an informed decision because we were always, first of all, we're always presented with like, these are calories. These are, you know, this is protein. And then very little is being taught about an actual yeah. like nourishment behind these foods. You're so right. My favorite, it's like, oh, we need protein. Okay. You want to, you want the worst animal-based protein or the worst plant-based protein? Do like, I get to pick? Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll do an, uh, animal-based. Spider venom. Pure protein. You can <laughs> eat that? No, it would be stupid, but it's protein. Okay. And then we go plant-based. Sarin, the nerve gas, is a, an extract from beans. Oh, no way. Like it kills people really quickly. It's one of the most toxic elements known to man. So maybe the kind of protein matters just a little bit. But <laughs> these clowns doing marketing, like, no, no, protein. So they will sell you a gluten keto cookie because gluten is protein. It says 20 grams of protein on the front. And you eat it and it shreds your gut and it causes brain fog and you wonder what's going on. It's because... Mm -hmm. Whether something has calories or not doesn't matter unless you know what the calories are. Whether it has protein or not doesn't matter unless you know what protein it is. Animal proteins work better than plant proteins. Most plant proteins come packaged with anti-nutrients. You need to know what they are and how your body responds to them. Maybe you can eat pea protein. You're still gonna have to eat twice as much of that as you would if you just had some cow protein, but at least you know. But you may also know, oh, soy protein has estrogen in it that messes with your cycle. Or if you're a guy, it gives you man boobs and small balls. <laughs> So maybe that's not the protein for you, like what, whatever. But you should unless, at least know. Unless you just want to have small balls, you know, maybe it's a choice, right? Yeah, there's a, a very serious condition that we should talk about. Um, it's benign <laughs> vegan-induced testicular atrophy, and it's a problem. Is it? <laughs> no, it's not real. You're fucking with me right now. No, it's totally real. Really? Yeah. No. You know what atrophy is, right? Yeah, like making smaller, right? <laughs> Yes. Let me be really, really blunt. When you go vegan, you have no saturated fats. It is well documented that vegans' testosterone levels drop. In fact, cornflakes were designed by the founder of Kellogg's, who was a weird reverend, to drop testosterone levels in men so we would have less sexual desire so then the world would not have evil in it. The guy was weird. <laughs> That's, That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again, peanut. <laughs> the timing. <laughs> Stay away, Dr. Kellogg. So what's going on is we have, uh, we have a problem where if you go, like I did, on a vegan diet, you will drop testosterone. You will drop muscle mass and maybe even feel like you're dropping weight, but it's not the good kind of weight. And if you're low testosterone, you're also low happiness because testosterone and dopamine ride together. So oh, if you've wondered why the stereotype of an angry vegan who's ungrounded, like the way I was, well, it's because our testosterone goes down for men and women. But yeah. also, like, I think in general in society, the testosterone levels are down so much by, you know, yeah. everything that mimics estrogen in the body that women are complaining, like, they're not, there are no real men, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I hate to not agree, but it's true. It's like, well, so what's going on, right? Like, why, yeah. it's, why are we lacking that true masculine energy? And also, I want to talk about sex and men and how too much sex is actually not great for men if you what's All right. the because well, there's we'll, a formula we'll right we'll get into that okay and I, I would disagree that too much sex is bad for men it's too much ejaculation oh that's we'll get there. okay good so that's first right. you asked about you know why are there no real men out there okay testosterone is down by 50 percent in women too so really in yeah. today's society oh, both absolutely. men and women yeah wow. so let me ask you this do you think your body makes more estrogen or more testosterone mine yeah, just any woman's body. I would say estrogen. No? 100 times more testosterone. No. Yeah. So when your testosterone is low, guess what happens? My estrogen is going to just overtake. And yeah, that, that happens. So the ratio is off, but something else happens in the world around you. Remember biohacking. You change the environment around you, so you have control of your biology. What do you think happens to men when there are no women who are fertile and ovulating in the world around them? 
oh my god like that's it's just kind of like a catch-22 right because it's like i'll tell you what happens our bodies without our conscious knowledge our bodies are like it's the end of the world there's there are no fertile women and i don't mean like like we're thinking about any of this just like we, we get pheromones like oh like the species can be alive and when everyone's on the pill which is very harmful for your hormones right but it mm -hmm. suppresses ovulation or we're just and pheromones as well yeah, yeah. testosterone is depressed so now our testosterone levels go down and also we're happy to play video games in grandma's basement because there's no reason to live literally if you want men to show up for women we need to sense that there are women around to show up for and it's not a conscious thing And I'm not mm -hmm. blaming women at all, but it, it's a it's a cycle. Men and women need each other to be healthy hormonally, mm -hmm. right? So you also, as a woman, need to be like, oh, there's guys around here with pheromones, even if they're guys you're uninterested in. You like, it's not about like sexual attraction. It's about the subtle environmental signal that says, like, there's a society, and our and and our species is moving forward. It's it's a low level signal. Yeah, I yeah. I 100 agree because I think it's just like having been traveling to different places you really sense the energy of men across the world and women right and mm -hmm. how they how they carry themselves how they make you feel and it's it's beyond you know looks it's beyond how they behave right it's it's something deeper right that we can yeah. pick up energetically but what's super interesting because it's like i know so many girlfriends um that aren't fertile and they are probably listening to this feeling super triggered or they feel like they're not enough or there's this you know that it's kind of like their fault and i always think of the scene in goodwill hunting when mm -hmm. robin williams tells matt damon like it's not your fault yeah because it really isn't the fault it's the environment that you live in that you, everything that you consume and all the chemicals are making you feel that way but now the first time a mistake second time is a choice now that you know what's going on you're choosing so it is their fault you're saying well it's just like <laughs> If they're not That's aware, what I, I guess what's if you're not aware, I get it. But now, like if you're listening to this and you already know, oh shit, maybe I okay. can like yeah. try to find out like what's the reason behind it. Then it's like you have you know. Here's an example you're of that. You're throwing me under the bus. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally messing with you, but but here's the thing, and and I've said this in biohacking. Like, look, if you're fat, it's your fault. People are like, how dare you? I'm like, oh, hold on a second here. I was 300 pounds. I did everything on earth to lose weight. I exercised 90 minutes a day, six days a week. It didn't work. So either it was my fault, which means I can change, or it wasn't my fault, which means I'm helpless and I'll be fat forever. So be grateful that it's your fault, except there are some things where the ship has already sailed, Yeah. right? So if you're dealing with fertility issues, there, there are a lot of things you can do that are not commonly known. In fact, my former wife of 17 years, um, dear friend, uh, co-parent, she was infertile when I met her, right? And diagnosed by her medical school colleagues. And we put together a diet <laughs> that restores fertility, especially so how, for PCOS. Can you just take me back mm -hmm. to that moment, right? So you're yeah. just basically newly married, you're about to have your first child, and then it turns out that you can't have kids. Yeah, we knew. Oh, you when knew we got before? Married, yeah. Uh, so she was... Oh, 35. Well, okay, so my age. My yeah, age. well, she was 35 when we got together. We didn't have our kids till 39 and 42. And when we got pregnant, it was the first time we tried at 39. But this was after several years of removing toxins, removing hormone disruptors, removing plant-based foods that were messing with her. Because that, that was, how long ago mm -hmm. was it? Um, well, we published the book in 2011 And the program, we started doing it probably in 2004, 2005. Wow. Because um, yeah. that's like back in the day, like, where did you even look, right? Like, I think it's like such an advantage now you can freaking ask Chad GDP, what would Dave do? Like, I literally <laughs> sometimes ask because I was like, I don't want to abuse our friendship. So I'm like, Chad GDP, what would Dave ask for your take right now? <laughs> I, I'm actually building a bot now that I'll put on, on DaveAspier.com that is populated with all of my notes, all of my research. Fuck yeah. Because when you ask chat GPT, it's like... It's not very good. Well, no, thank you. It goes, you should always ask your doctor before you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before you have permission to like breathe. <laughs> and and like, chat GPT, Dave Asprey would not say that. Like Dave Asprey yeah. says you are your own doctor and you hire your doctor because they're an expert when you need advice. Yeah. Like, But for some yeah. reason, it, it doesn't say that's what I say. So chat GPT, you're a lying bastard. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, so there's going to be a, a bot on your website yeah. that's basically going to be like, hey, you know, I'm struggling with X, Y, and Z. What would you recommend? Amazing. And, and you're saying, like, how did I know all this? I hung out with my elders. Like one of the best things you could ever do if you want to have babies, you want to be fertile, find a grandma who had healthy kids and healthy grandkids and sit down and be like, what do I need to know about motherhood? What do I need? To, and they know everything. They've made every mistake you're going to make. And what we feel like when we're young is that they could never understand me. But no, they were young like us. Yeah. So, I mean, mentoring yeah. is beautiful. You just came with someone mm -hmm. right here that you're mentoring, um, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah, he's, he's 21. We're hanging out for the day and uh, talking about, uh, interestingly, uh, we're talking about masculine and feminine, right? And, you know, dating in today's modern world and how to pick a partner and things like that. It, it's such important things. And I, at this point, I like to think I might be halfway decent at it. Um, again, <laughs> I am uh, divorced after 17 years. Oh, but well, I'm the worst too, so hey. In a good way, right. Yeah, so. <laughs> but it, I feel like it doesn't learn. really dismiss your, you know, it's it's been 17 years and it's also like part of knowing yourself and knowing like, oh, like that stage is done. I'm so grateful. It sounds like you guys are friends yeah. and, you know, you have kids together, which is yeah. beautiful. Yeah, the kids are happy and healthy and we're connected and it's possible. You just don't hear about that stuff online. It's always the dramatic blow ups and yeah. So if you're with a partner and you're both evolving and you evolve in different directions, fine. And if you pick the wrong partner and it's ruining your life, fine, good. So yeah. when, whenever someone says, I'm getting divorced, I'm like, congratulations, is the first thing I say. You quit doing something that wasn't working. No. Right? Do okay. you think uh, that mindset came from you doing 40 years of Zen? No, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. 40 years of Zen has changed my perspective on everything. Amazing. So I'm going to get, get go there in a second. Could you please just go back to how often should should men oh, ejaculate sex. all yeah. right let's talk about sex yes. so here's this this just makes me laugh okay years ago i'm so i've studied a lot of esoteric stuff i've traveled around the world to meditation with the masters and just all, all kinds of things and that includes uh, tantric practices somatic embodied uh, like erotic practices and um, stuff that that's actually part of hindu practice part of traditional chinese medicine but the spiritual side of that stuff and one of the things you'll hear from the Taoists is age in years minus seven divided by four. That's the number of days that you should have between ejaculations. So age in years, let's say you're 37, right? And minus seven, you're down to 30 divided by four. So 30 divided by four, what is that? Uh, About seven. Be... Seven times four is 28. About seven. Yeah. What that means is ejaculate once a week or less frequently. And you do that to maintain your health. And I love that you made the distinction between this is not about not having sets, about ejaculation. Oh, I published the data for a year in my book, Game Changers. Literally, there's a graph of how frequently I orgasms, how frequently I had sex. I remember that, happiness. actually. And yeah. I appreciate it, the detail. Because then I could like bring in, it's like, hey, look. <laughs> well, here's what happens. If you learn as a guy to have sex, to be focused on your partner, and to be happy whether or not you ejaculate, you will want to go again and again and again. Okay, you will have a lot more sex. Your partner, when her eyes stop being rolled back in her head, will be like, God, you want more? All right, fine. Okay, that's actually good for oxytocin levels. It builds a close partnership because there's continued intimacy. And what John Gray, the Mars and Venus guy, and, and a friend and a mentor, taught me is that after a man ejaculates, there's a 24 to 48 hour precipitous drop in testosterone, which is why, will you respect me in the morning? Well, the answer is no, because my testosterone dropped it to the floor and says I don't have testosterone, I have dopamine, so I'm standoffish and I'm, yeah. So I tracked my happiness level for the year, and the, the strangest things that the Taoist said was, if you want to live forever, ejaculate once every 30 days, but keep your orgasm to less than an hour. I'm like, I call bullshit. Okay, so I'm going to disprove these, these old guys because a lot of biohacking is proving old practices, but this one yeah. is too weird. So after a year, I'm like, they were right. So I, I did learn how to go 30 days without ejaculating while having sex. As, in fact, the less you ejaculate, the more sex you have. So this was... And are sex. you... I'm like, I'm asking this question. But were were you able to orgasm without ejaculation? Yes. So but that's not easy. 
for a well, guy, I hear. You, you learn, and there's two ways to do it. One is called injaculation, where you actually release the, you release the, the semen internally, mm-hmm. and then the energy from that recirculates according to these teachings. And then the other thing that's possible is you can have like whole body orgasms that don't evolve any yeah. semen being released. And what surprised me, and actually was kind of scary, was, okay, I would go 30 days, and then it, it was time to finally have an ejaculation, right? And have a really big orgasm. And that stuff about orgasming for less than an hour, men can have a half hour orgasm. And it, it's kind of nice, but it also at a certain point, like my abs hurt. Like, could it just freaking stop already? And you're like, no, you're not done yet. And you're just laying there. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to breathe deep. I'm going to breathe deep. And it's like, I'm having a baby here, right? I mean, I've had like prolonged orgasms. Yeah. Or- and I was like, oh, wow, like that is actually like a, a full time job. Like it gets yeah. you tired, but also like s- super liberating to know that it is possible because, again, this is not something that you get taught in school. No, they don't teach any of this stuff. And yeah, they just like traditional, you know, 10 minutes, you know, and you're done. Yeah, that's not how it's supposed to be. Um, minimum should be two hours if it's just like a, a short thing. And then both partners can be in like very altered states like you've done mushrooms in fact i think conscious sex practices are more important for for biohacking than psychedelics when you do them right it can be that powerful but you have to feel safe both partners uh, especially the woman and then when you can connect energetically you can go into the same places that you would go to on mushrooms or acid or whatever Mm. so funny that you bring that up because not that i'm not aware that you can get places without psychedelics but obviously it's like a nice shortcut kind of like sure. supplements i'm like oh i like psychedelics so you invited me to 40 years of zen and the whole idea is that you don't do psychedelics yep. and i was like okay can i just have a little bit of mushrooms no. or a little bit of that and it was like this whole thing that you know aggie's weird but i was like wow just like i can't imagine sitting in a pod for you know hours every day without any external support in a way right because i'm a busy person i'm constantly thinking of what to do so we'll get to that in a second but let's just uh, rewind because i want to get to the the reason behind 40 years of zen how did you okay. start it and what's the science behind it and well, by the way, my notebook is still here with me so 40 years of zen is a five-day intense neurofeedback program that replaces decades of daily meditation practice and I got there because I'm really lazy. No. I got there because I don't have decades to meditate because I'm doing stuff that Wait, matters. Wait, you don't want to live in a cave in, in India? You know, it, it, <laughs> sounds kind of, it sounds kind of luxurious, you know? You just have to sit there and do that. But really, most people are too busy. And if you take an hour a day to meditate, great. But that means you're not spending an hour with your kids or with your community or doing something else. I'm willing to do that. I've done breath work for an hour a day for years. And at the same time as I've developed my meditation, my esoteric practices, I bought an EEG machine back in the late 90s. And this is a machine that reads brainwaves. And I did it because I found the only guy who would do this in Silicon Valley. It was a chiropractor. And I walked in for my first appointment. And it was a very rudimentary system back then. And I'm in the lobby and there's like a fish tank and bead curtains and everything. And this little kid, maybe eight, nine, runs up and just looks at me, starts screaming. and just runs in a circle around me and doesn't stop. And, and I'm like, what is, you know, kind of jangling. So I did my session and left. I come back six weeks later, same little kids in the lobby and I'm trying to hide. And he walks up, he goes, hi, my name's Bobby. And I'm like, what happened? And I asked the doctor, he said, oh yeah. He's been doing neurofeedback, so he can now regulate his own brain. So I'm not crazy, so what do I do? I go out and I buy my own machine, right? And wow. I started learning how to do it. And I realized very quickly, doing brain surgery on yourself is stupid. <laughs> so you can edit your brain to the point it doesn't work very well, and you won't know it because it's your brain that, that, that can get you in trouble. So what I started doing was I started working with different professionals around the planet on learning different things. And what I found is the Dalai Lama had put out a $100,000 bounty for any neuroscientist who could help him reach this advanced meditation state in under four hours. I'm like, oh. So the he people- did? Are, yeah, absolutely. He's very interested in neuroscience. Oh, well, I had no idea. Yeah. And the deal is, look, these are places I want to go. Show me a better way. So 
hurry, meditate faster is actually honorable. Wow. Right? It's, impatience is not honorable, but getting there faster and in a clean way is so efficient and effective, and it honors every minute you have here on the planet. So what I did is I, I imagine like you're yeah. running so many businesses, and all of a sudden, hey, I'm going to start a full on, you know, another company, which it was. Then I'm like, <laughs> it was a lot of work, but I've spent six months of my life with electrodes glued to my head for hours a day, learning how to meditate and to get into these states, and. When you do that, each, each of those five-day periods is equivalent to 10, 20 years of daily practice. And why can I sit here and do what I do and be present? It's because I trained my brain that way. It's also because I feed my brain this way. I nourish myself this way. Like I put love in my life. I do everything I know how to do. But 40 years of Zen is, is my highest and best way to take someone and say, there are states that do not have words and there are things you cannot see that are blocking you. And we're gonna use technology to help show you the path so you do the unlocking. I can't unlock it for you, but mm -hmm. we can shine a bright light on it and we can hold the light on it no matter how much you squirm so that you can face it and you can permanently remove it as a hindrance in your life. So I've gone through every single trigger I have, at least that I'm aware of. There's probably some I don't know about, but if I find them, I'll get those too. And I've run the reset process from 40 years of Zen on them. I process my divorce that way. Wow. I process you know, people embezzling money. I process people trying to steal companies from me. Anything like that. In fact, even when Joe Rogan came after me, my reputation, because he was trying to sell a competing product, process that. And what you do is... Did you for forgive him? Oh, of course. And the reality is every time Joe Rogan said I was a bad man, I sold more coffee. Like, like Joe, say more about me. It's fine. It doesn't matter. That's, that's reality. But at the time, it was really triggering. So I'm like, but I, but I helped him. It's not fair. Like, I did the right yeah. thing, and I'm getting punished for it. Everyone has that trigger. Like, betrayal and injustice is a big thing. Yeah. But the idea there is I could have carried the grudge. Every grudge you carry about everyone who ever broke your heart, every time your parents yelled at you or your boss or your coach, whatever, it's your energy that's going into just spiraling around. It doesn't hurt the other person, it hurts you. So I made a commitment to let go of everything. And if I find it, I go back and I let go of it. But so, because it's like you're yeah. not a free person because you know, if you're holding all the grudge, all the expectations, you're constantly kind of like tied energetically yeah. to other people. And so funny, so when you, we, you first came on a podcast, one of the questions I ask you, how come you, what do I have to do to give less fucks? Because that was like my impression of you. Yeah. But also, you know, I'm entering biohacking space. I was in travel. Uh, I'm not a doctor. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I look like someone that would be very easy to dismiss. And a lot of people in the space and outside of the space, it's just like, who the fuck is she? Just little blonde influencer, you know, just everything that they can come up with to dismiss me. And you always supported me. And mm. we're kind of like, I think the best comparison is to basically say that like while others were building a taller fence, you're building a longer table and it's like, yeah, mm. there's room, there's room. Yeah, there's always and room. I was like, and it's very inclusive and it's just not coming from an ego. It's, it's really hard to do, by the way. I'm still trying, but like, it's hard, right? Because the initial reaction always. of ego is like, oh no, like not too many people are talking about biohacking where in fact we're competing with the big pharma. So the more the better because yeah. they're like trillion dollar companies making people sick. So we're like, even if we all got together, we're like not even a that, half a percentage of what they're, you know, selling. You, you're in a, you're explaining exactly why I didn't trademark the name biohacking. I wrote the definition. You could my, have. My name's in the dictionary. I didn't do that because I wanted you to be able to do this. And I want people to talk about biohacking. And this is about all of us having control of our own biology. It's not about me being able to tell you how to do it. So you're, you're welcome to talk about it. I appreciate that you're sharing accurate information because it's kind of sad when someone's like, I'm a vegan biohacker. I'm like, it doesn't work, man. Like I want it to work. It just doesn't. But I still respect someone's right to do that because the community will self-correct. And I
Instagram, uh, whenever there's money and power involved, people are yeah. very nice to you. And behind closed doors, they kind of like, fuck off, basically. Yeah. And you're not mm. like that. And you even agreed to write the forward for my book, which I basically was so terrified to ask you <laughs> that I messaged Jim quick. I'm like, if he says no, can you talk to him? <laughs> He's like, You're okay. so funny. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. And we Jim, had a backup plan. <laughs> Jim's a good friend too. But here's the thing: like the, the whole story in your head. What was that? Well, like the feeling of like being an imposter. So it was imposter syndrome, huh? Did you work on that at 40 years of Zen? I did. Oh my god, you're making me cry. But um, I guess it's still there. You know, just being some of it. Yeah. Is that is it a not being enough, or is it an imposter thing? Because it can be mm. either or. I think it's both, but I think it's just like never being treated seriously. Mm. When <laughs> is the first time that you weren't taken seriously that you can mm. remember that you felt like that? I love that we're having a therapy right now. <laughs> um, that would be hard to access right now, but I think it's just, just with my parents, you know, they're amazing people, but I think there was always this, it didn't really matter how I felt about certain things, mm -hmm. you know, because it was the truth that had to be followed. And um, yeah, in school, you know, just being a girl, being blonde, and then being an immigrant is just like all was always. So those are things that you can run a reset process off of when you're at 40 years is in, you already know how to do the process. You can do I have a whole too. notebook of things I was resetting, <laughs> <laughs> just so you know. And, and when you reset, it's like, if you can be triggered by something, it means you're carrying a loaded gun and you take the yeah, bullets still. out of the gun so you can't be triggered anymore. So you, you made a ton of progress when you were there and there's there's always more. Oh, I'm coming back. I yeah. was like, I was like, I'll go once, you know, can't be that, you know, I'll be fine. And then <laughs> I'm like, after the first one, I'm like, I'm, what's the earliest I can come back? It was literally my first question. So let's go back to 40 years of Zen. You arrive in this beautiful property surrounded uh, by incredible trees. You're welcome with like fluffy flip flops and a bulletproof coffee. You have a private chef who's amazing and makes you all the, the most delicious meals. It's a small group of three. We, Heather, who was our uh, facilitator, I would, I would call her a doula. You know, she was <laughs> so much more than that because she had the soft skills of just mm -hmm. like a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but also very knowledgeable. She was amazing. But we'll call it empathy because. They're not they're not licensed therapists or psychologists or psychiatrists, better. but we understand we're, we're trauma informed and they understand the reset process because they're trained in it. So and, let's and let's talk about based. the reset yeah. process because you know you get there. I'm like, okay, this is all fancy, and they make you do all the work. And I was like, wait, I thought I just gonna like lie down, <laughs> you plug me in, and I'll be all zen. And they're like, no, you have to put the work. And I was like, oh, that's like I was like, really. <laughs> I was like, dang, I thought it was be easier. So, and then, okay, so the recent process is basically a, a way to forgive somebody first by allowing yourself to feel all the feelings that come up, all the anger, all the disappointment, mm -hmm. and then you forgive them all the way through to love. So my question to you is, why is forgiveness so important for your brain health mm -hmm. and accessing all these higher states of consciousness? And second, I had, a, I had a really hard time getting angry because I over-intellectualized the whole experience and yeah. be like, you know, my parents were the way they are because, but they're my parents. So I spent the first two days not being able to get angry. And Heather yeah. kept poking me. I'm like, come yeah. on, Aggie, come on. I was like, And the no. third day you popped into anger, right? Yeah. It happens on the third day for a lot of people. When I started doing this kind of work, and you can do like a, an, a loving kindness types of meditation or a big heart are relatively similar states neurologically. Um, but to tap into those feelings, so you learn as a woman typically that it's not okay to get angry, right? Yeah, so, crazy bitch. Basically. Yeah, so you push it down. So what men learn is if I get angry, people will die, right? Especially if you're the largest guy in class, which is what I was, because I was fat and I was taller than everyone. So I, you know, a little guy half my size would pick a fight with me because he's a bully. I'm like, I'm gonna sit on him and he can't breathe. Like, <laughs> like they don't understand physics in seventh grade, apparently, right? But but, <laughs> but also for guys, like there's a lot of shame in crying for a girl. Well, oh yeah, so so we're not gonna show vulnerability, but we also know that if we show anger, like people really can be harmed, right? Yeah. So we lock down, and then you lock down because it's unacceptable. Right, so to tap into anger or to tap into shame, which is a way of hiding anger and suppressing, or to tap into sadness, right? 
Well, once you get into anger, it's actually pretty good because anger is relatively evolved compared mm. to apathy or numbness, which is where so many people sit. So mm. you're going to go in and if you're stuck, not in apathy, which is what, what I wouldn't see, but you're, you're stuck in possibly uh, sadness, right? Or in my head, right? Like just remembering in, the experience, but I'm like so dis disassociated yeah. because, you know, I'm super heady about the whole experience. So I can't really let myself feel all the feelings. Mm. So the, the head is the realm of masculine energy, right? So a lot of women, especially in the workplace, they feel forced to go into their head. So instead of checking in with their, their heart or their intuition, which can be from the gut, even from like the reproductive system, this gets all shut down. And then you go to your head and then there's this sense of anxiety or even betrayal because the body's like, you're not listening to me. The heart's, mm -hmm. you're not listening to me. Like I'm here. And you, you catch that and you put it right in your head. Right. And then when you broke through and like, oh, I am going to listen to my body and holy crap, look how angry it is. And then you can do the work to turn off the triggers for anger so that the anger isn't sitting in there waiting to get out. It's just not there. And it's so much less energy every day. Like it just frees up so much. Like I said, I took six months of doing this to get to where I am now because I probably had a lot of anger to work on. I know I did. Because right. it's like, I think Heather said, it's basically like holding a beach ball underwater. Mm -hmm. It's like that energy of like suppressing, suppressing, suppressing. Yeah. And I think there's this level for me that, you know, now being very lucky, very successful, there's this level of like, oh, like you don't get to be angry or struggle because you have already all these things in your life. So <laughs> shut up and be grateful. Okay. One, one of the most powerful videos I've seen lately is the founder of NVIDIA. This is a graphics card maker, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of value or something like a really big company and an interviewer just asked him when you started this company with a friend in a garage 30 years ago what advice would you give yourself and he says don't do it and because like what do you mean like you know you have your own jets like you're the most successful he goes no one knows for entrepreneurs the amount of suffering the amount of mm -hmm. shame the amount of stress the amount of pressure he's like i wouldn't wish it on anyone okay so if the story, I mean, it's true, right? It's totally true that the stuff that entrepreneurs like you and me go through, the reason that, um, the reason that you join Entrepreneur Masterminds, I, I'm running one with Naveen yeah, Jain. Yeah, we were just talking about it before yeah. we started filming. It's called the Apollo Group. So Naveen Jain and Vishen Lakhiani and I, we mentor a small group of people. So you can talk with other entrepreneurs about the stuff that normal people don't understand because they're not under this kind of pressure. And externally, like, well, you have money and you have fame or you have a lifestyle, but it is not free. And that's why so many entrepreneurs go to 40 years of Zen too. Cause they're like, Oh, they were miserable. all like, yeah. High, <laughs> high level individuals that are just basically like, I would do anything, but it's, it's such for me on day five on Friday, I had an ayahuasca like experience. Yeah. I was Happens like, and that was a thank you for, for showing to me that I didn't have to yeah. have ayahuasca to have that. My, t I send you the, you know, the before and after of my brainwaves. And I was like, there's no way I could access that by myself. I have goosebumps thinking about yeah. it, but I, I for, I, the biggest one was forgiving myself. That's the biggest and hardest. Yeah. And if you'd have taken Aya, it wouldn't have done that for you either. You wouldn't have got there. Yeah. I, I love that it, it, it felt like it was me, but also like it was an external energy guiding me through this whole experience. I got to forgive <laughs> myself for not saying goodbye to my grandfather mm -hmm. uh, who passed away. I got to say goodbye to him this time. I really went mm -hmm. back to that place. Beautiful. It was amazing. He got to meet Jacob. It was like all of these things. It was incredible. Without drugs. Without drugs, yeah. yeah. And it was like super, super healing. So like giving yourself things that you wouldn't get otherwise. And so that brought so much power to me. Do you think it changed your relationship? All relationships, yeah. right? But the relationship with myself, so I think it's really beautiful that you said because it's, I still get stuck in masculine energy just because so much was going on and try to come back to my feminine as much as possible. So after 40 years of Zen, I couldn't bring myself to push myself so much. So the plan mm. was, I'm getting, they said, relax before 40, after 40 years of Zen. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I land <laughs> at midnight. The next day I have my massive engagement party. Two days later, I'm flying to Europe for three days and then back to Miami and then to Bali. That was the plan. And I go to Europe. I'm like, no, I don't need to go to Miami. I don't yeah. need to fly across the world. I 
I'm chasing, I'm coming from an energy of chase. I'm like, I'm not going, even though I was super excited um, to uh, go to Russell Branson event. And I was like, I, I cannot bring myself to, to just come from that energy. So in a way it made me more respectful towards myself. Sometimes listening to what your body needs is the hardest thing, especially for entrepreneurs. And what you learn when you have a spiritual practice for enough time where you do 40 years in the way you did is that men and women can shift from, from either feminine to masculine or masculine to feminine, right? And you have access to the full slate of energetic states and you can effortlessly and painlessly pull out the right one for the right situation, but that you sit in your state which is yeah. a feminine state for you yeah. and for me it's masculine, but I'm no longer unsafe. Like if someone needs a hug and they need a maternal hug, I can do that. And it, it doesn't make me less of a man or more of a man. It's, it's just, oh, the whole thing is available. And when you feel resistance to a state, like you do, well, I'm, I'm getting masculine, like oh, I'm feeling resistance to feminine, that resistance is something that needs resetting. Because like, oh, I'm gonna totally access my power, I'm gonna go into a masculine state, or I'm gonna address the problem by going into a, a powerful feminine state. Those are all within your ability to do, and there's mm -hmm. no judgment on any of them, but we judge ourselves. And the forgiveness you have on yourself is so powerful. And, and that's why I built that, that, that whole program. So yeah. talk about the science behind it, because obviously okay. they don't just put you in a capsule and it's like, that's it, you, here's your box of tissues, here's a little <laughs> spray for your face so you don't fall asleep. It, you actually are plugged in, yeah. right? So what is the machine called? What does it do? Well, we build the machines. There's seven patents in neuroscience that we've been granted for 40 years of sun. I didn't know that. Yeah. And we build the machines and we build um, the software as well. And what we're doing is we're gluing electrodes to your head and they get electricity that your brain is leaking. And that tells us very accurately what your brain is doing. And then when you're running this reset process and we teach you how to do the steps, it, it's like personal development plus science. So then you're sitting there, your eyes are closed. You're in these pods that we've custom built for you. So you just feel nice and enclosed and you're sitting there and you're doing it. And when you do it right, the sounds get louder. You hear yes, more you get bugs. a little gong, right? Yeah. It's like gong. Right? So if you do it right, you keep hearing it. If you're not doing it because you're thinking, oh, what should I, you know, should I buy another dress? <laughs> then it stops. So you're like, okay, I need to go back, which is kind of like neurofeedback. So it rewards you for yeah. staying in a certain state. It, it is neurofeedback. The thing that's different is that there's a lot of math that happens. So we get electricity off the brain and then you do something to it in order to play a sound back to encourage the brain to do one thing versus another thing. So we figured out some really cool stuff about what we want your brain to do as you're going through the reset process. And it's correlated with that feeling of like your heart opening. You felt that mm -hmm. when you were there. Well, your brain does something very specific when you do it. And after you do this for a little while, it's like exercise. The body goes, oh, I'm gonna have to do this again. You've heard of the 10,000 hour rule, which is fake by the way. <laughs> Uh, but the idea is you're supposed to do something over and over yeah. and you get really good at it. It's 10,000 hours if you don't know how to do it. Uh, it's much less than that. And what we're doing with your brain is a thousand times a second we're correcting it. So when you're sitting there and you're like feeling you're like, okay, what's the state that I want to go into in, in order to you know, stop being triggered by this thing? So you're like really working on it. Your eyes are closed. And should you go left or should you go right? Well, how would you know? Oh, thank you. There you go. You would know because the sound gets louder. And even worse, it's not like you're going left or right because these are altered states, kind of like, you know, you're you're taking a hallucinogen even though you're not. So I don't have words for it. There are not words. In, in fact, my favorite English word is ineffable. And it's a word that means there aren't words for it. So everything I'm trying to show you, trying to explain here, there aren't words to tell you what's happening. So why don't I just show you? Go in there and make the sounds louder. And then all the math happens in the computer. And as long as the sounds get louder, your brain went into this new state that you didn't know. And That's so, what we're doing. And so we, you also do caps. And that actually just blows my mind. Yeah. Like, so what, what, what the what hell? That is? So this is, it looks like a big spider that comes down on your head. And this is a 3D printed... Um, cap that holds electrodes in place on 24 spots on your head. So our, our main reset training is a, a much lower number of, um, there's a much lower number of electrodes cause you don't need it for that. So what, you first scan your brain on the Monday morning. It's like, mm. this is your baseline. Okay. Let me go back. Um, we'll, we'll edit this in a little bit. 
<laughs> Good so, luck to the editor. <laughs> so, so when you come in the first day, we use the cap, mm -hmm. and that gives us a clinical grade assessment of your brain. Now, you can do a QEEG, that's called. You can do that anywhere. It'll run about a thousand bucks. Problem is, they're comparing your brain to the average brain of 1970s muggles. Because the data set that they got was just random people from the 70s. And they're still saying, well, you're higher than this and lower than this. I'm like, newsflash, people have evolved. <laughs> right? So at 40 years of Zen. So savage, but yes. <laughs> well, sorry. Uh, we can compare you to other people who have been through the program. And right now we have the largest database of high performance brains, along with all the other data that goes around it, in existence, according to our neuroscientist at the University of Victoria. So how do you score compared to other entrepreneurial people, compared to other people who've done substantial things in the world? And maybe that's more interesting. We'll give you both. Yeah. And then that gives you strengths and weaknesses. And it gives you opportunities. So then when you've done your reset for three days, now it's time to go in and say, right, do you want to fill in some potholes? Do you want to accelerate your strengths? And I always encourage people, accelerate your strengths. Let's double down on superpowers. Because the things that you're relatively weak at, we might be able to make you average if you work really hard. But who cares? You can hire someone to do that. Yeah. Like, do your superpowers. And when people do that during the cap training, you can only do about 20, sometimes 40 minutes of that before your brain's like, I'm cooked. Yeah, uh, that's the thing, right? So I was like, you get there and it's like, it's only 20 minutes. I'm like, wait, why is it so short? And then you do it and you're like, oh my God, give me all the food from the kitchen. Yeah. I was so hungry. That's why there's an executive chef. Like I would make the program cheaper and you know feed you guys you know, frozen meals if I could, but it, it would be a disservice to you. Yeah. You're running like a marathon with your brain every day when you're there. And what I found is if I didn't feed you the stuff, including some MCT oil, including the other things, you can only do about half as much brain training before you hit the wall. So mm. I'm. Meanwhile, you have Pierre, yeah. who's like, mm -hmm. you know, we have, all, you know, there was an incredible bulletproof desserts as well. Like, all, they're all healthy. And I'm like, oh my God, it's like the dream restaurant where it's like everything's there. Yeah. It's yeah. because you're just not going to get the work done if you're not nourished. Yeah. And I don't want to waste one minute of your time. It's, it's, I'm honored when anytime someone's going to come and spend five days uh, with my team and me doing relatively esoteric practices that are going to change their life, I, I'm not going to waste a minute of it. Yeah. So why do you think that f that forgiveness is such a big part of app, you know, biohacking your brain? Forgiveness is a part of every major religious practice uh, in Christianity. Forgive them. They know not what they do. There's a reason he said that. And when you look at the Eastern practices, there's forgiveness, there's surrender. But what isn't taught even in really big personal development practices really big books in order to forgive something it's not about telling someone you forgive them or that whatever they did was okay you never have to talk to them again and what they did wasn't okay forgiveness is just you turning a switch so it no longer triggers you mm -hmm. and to to enter that state that's why i call it the reset mode instead of forgiveness um, to enter that state you must find gratitude so, but also to allow mm -hmm. yourself to feel anger, which I that was like the hard one, right? Well, so like, no, it doesn't have to be anger. You have no, to feel yeah, whatever you were feeling. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so you just whatever were super feeling. angry. Yeah. I'm just. Guys, you heard her first. Aggie, very angry. <laughs> you can tell when you look. Okay. <laughs> no, but uh, but oh, like sometimes sadness or disappointment or like yeah. this feeling when you like disappoint yourself, which is a, com a combination of all of them. But like really, what, what, what I guess what was being taught by your stuff is that like you can't forgive without allowing yourself to feel all the feelings. And then you can transition that, that all of those emotions into forgiveness. Yeah. Instead of just going straight, I'm like, I forgive everybody. Yeah, forgiveness is not done in the brain at all. It's done in the body. So what you do to really release something to do the reset, and this is the last two chapters of Smarter Not Harder. I, I describe mm -hmm. it as best I can. But what you're doing is you're going into this altered state, maybe with breath work, or I think that meditation is the best way or mm -hmm. neurofeedback. You go into this altered state and then you're saying, okay, what is it very specifically that I'm going to reset? And then you feel the feelings, right? And we're taught to not feel the feelings or even worse, when I started doing work when I was 30 on this kind of stuff, I didn't know what my feelings were other than anger. That was the only feeling I had. Anger. Yeah, because I didn't have labels for all of them. Yeah. Right? I didn't know. Right? And so maybe I was ignorant. But usually even when people come to 
uh, they come to 40 years of Zen, they don't necessarily know, am I feeling betrayal right? or am I feeling injustice? Like, and, and how does that affect me? So there's all these nuanced mm -hmm. feelings and we all try to find words for feelings that, that are tied to a feeling in the body, but it's very clunky. So I'm like, well, let's just have the computers help us with that. So then whatever the feeling is, like feel that way and you can give it a name or not. And when you do that, okay, now you're in the state where the nervous system is primed and looking around for that. And then you put gratitude in, which is like a key in the lock. You find one good thing that happened, even though something bad happened. It doesn't matter how small it is. That unlocks it. And then you do the rest of the practices that are there. And when you're done, you're no longer triggerable. No. And, and it's, it's so freeing. And it also frees up a huge amount of electricity. Because every grudge you're holding, every negative thought, every time you suppress your own thoughts or your own emotions, it takes electricity. And that electricity could be used for keeping you younger. It could be used for you know, hugging company, someone. Yeah. Yeah, anything that's important to you. So it's just waste. And I don't like waste. So that's why it matters. I think it's super interesting that you, know, you live quite a chunk of your adult life and no one's ever taught you how to forgive. It's crazy. It's like, isn't that like one of the most important skills? Because we get hurt all the time. Everyone's so offended. And like no mm. one has ever sat you down in school and be like, hey, this is how you can help oh. forgive. Isn't that funny? That it's like a, it, it's a thing you need, to, you need to have to survive. Otherwise, you fry on so many levels. How many people do you know who know how to forgive? I mean, I didn't know. There's, until there's almost none. I mean, that's... Why? I didn't know what it takes to forgive, yeah. you know? It, it's completely missing from our consciousness for 99.999% of people. You'll find it in monasteries and a few places and a few old practices. But it's something that's reliable, it's repeatable, it's trainable, and it's something that gives you energy back. Mm -hmm. So how could I not make that available for people? And I target people who are affecting millions of people. Like, I, I want you to come to 40 years of Zen if you're influencing a lot of people because you'll influence them better, you'll be more conscious. If you're investing billions of dollars, come to 40 years of Zen, you'll be a better investor, but you'll also mm -hmm. make investments more consciously, right? If, you're, if you have 10,000 people working for you and sometimes people with much larger companies come through, yeah, yeah. you make one decision better that more than pays for the five days of time. Yeah, 100%. It's just really interesting that like all the things that are, are the ultimate biohacks, like having better orgasms, knowing how to forgive. It's not something that we learn in there, school or no. otherwise. There's you know? a connection between those, by the way. What's oh, yeah? holding you back from life-changing orgasms? Not being able to allow yourself to feel emotions. Yeah, you got to be able to tap into your emotions. And the other thing is, remember earlier I mentioned that apathy mm -hmm. is like the lowest level of vibration. When we experience trauma or shaming as men or women, we disconnect from certain parts of our body and our anatomy. And huge numbers of women are walking around and they've disconnected themselves from their cervix, from their mm. ovaries, from different parts of their vagina. And guys too, we disconnect ourselves from our anatomy as well. And when that happens, you're not gonna know because it's not you're not gonna feel it, right? And if, if that's turned off, it's really hard to have a life-changing orgasm. Mm. So you end up doing the reset process on yourself for disconnecting. Yeah. And then you do a reset process on your dick, if that's what you have an issue with, or on women who shamed you or whatever thing is. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, like I'm having hour long orgasms and that didn't happen before. A lot of it is around how you actually talk to the parts of your body. And you're talking to it not with words really, but you're talking to it with emotions. And it's really related to that reset process. So they're connected. Wow, that was super spot on. <laughs> no, it really was yeah. it's super like profound to just realize how we really are shamed for, you know, not looking a certain way mm -hmm. or not, you know, we watch porn and we think that this is it. And then I think for women, there's also this like the savior complex of like wanting to be saved and or find a guy who's like amazing in bed instead of taking charge into our own hands and realizing that if we can.
things. So it's the stuff. And the plan is to have more upgrade labs than McDonald's. There you go. I love it. People would, yeah, we'd put McDonald's out of business if people (laughs) felt that good. Right? Right. We totally would. So what we're doing there, one of the five or six big tracks you can choose is cognitive function. So we've taken the technology from 40 years of Zen and we have it there at Upgrade Labs. So oh, we you do? On. Yes, we do. And you do it in 20 minute segments. And oh, I need to do it. You can't really go do the reset mode unless you've yeah, been trained yeah. on it. You need facilitators and you know yeah, why yeah, yeah. because like, it took you, you three you, days to get there. Yeah. And also, like, it's, you're, you need to feel safe. And I've seen people, you know, deal with stuff that they haven't deal, dealt with 30 yeah. years and you just don't want to be like you know hey, i need to go back in yeah. five or ten minutes because it's it's very deep so we will get you to advanced meditation states in those 20 minutes but we're not going to take you through the reset process because i can't i would if i could it just wouldn't be yeah it wouldn't be a benefit to people so that's happening and then at 40 years of zen uh, we are very close to being able to have the, the ability to do the reset process without all the cap training at home Oh, in, well. in groups of people just over Zoom. So it's not done yet. It's not launched yet, but we're very close. And that'll be about half the cost of the normal program. Wow. The goal at the end of the day is to be able to make it so accessible uh, that we can put it in high schools. Because if you did this as a senior in high school, every bully, every mean teacher, and all of the parenting mistakes your parents made despite their best efforts, and every time little Susie broke your heart, all of those... You'd walk out of high school and have no triggers whatsoever. And then let's see what you might do. Meanwhile, we leave high school with nothing but trauma, right? Yeah, exactly. So So interesting. That's the world that's coming. Wow. What else is uh, in your world? What's coming up? Well, we've got Upgrade Labs. Um, People are are opening franchises all over. That's cool. There's uh, 40 Years of Zen. There's Danger Coffee which is available at Upgrade Labs. And Danger Coffee is the new mineral uh, enriched coffee, mold-free you've been talking about on your show. Yeah, and thank you for your support. It's downstairs, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, it, it feels different. And I haven't really talked about this one publicly, but I'm in the late stages of forming a $100 million venture capital fund to invest in longevity companies, but extending human lifespan. That's, wow. Yeah, that's why I was overseas. I was um, raising some capital for it. $100 million. Yeah, and I'm not talking about, I want to you know, reduce risk or I want to reduce risk or something like that. I'm talking about adding decades to human life. And I know we can do it. I wrote a big book on it. There's ways in some of the companies that I've uncovered. Like if you think biohacking's awesome, I just did gene therapy. I just did a whole two hour episode on that. That should take nine years off my age, just one injection. Well, so I literally, I commented on that um on that post, I haven't listened to the podcast yet. Um, can you talk about it a little bit? Because it's that you offer it on your website. Was it a link? Oh, geez, I forget the link. It's probably... We'll find it and we'll it, link it in the show Dave notes. It's daveasprey.com slash gene therapy, probably. But if not, like, find the link. <laughs> and uh, so, and I don't offer... I'm just connecting people so they yeah. can get to the, the front of the line. It's expensive. It's more expensive than 40 years of Zen. Uh, but I've never seen anything that'll take nine years off of your epigenetic age in one shot like and so that's like what what's exciting to me it's like i see women freezing their eggs mm-hmm. which makes them down regulate their hormones and they go through menopause earlier and when i'm like and this is being preventative at age 21 wouldn't you want to have a gene therapy when it keeps your eggs young so oh, you yeah. can have kids at 40 without you know the clock that's amazing like and sorry but like i don't know how much how much is the gene therapy it's twenty five thousand. yeah it's the same as freezing eggs it's the same as freezing eggs and here's the thing you see increases in bone density people lose about one percent body fat they put on a couple pounds of muscle with no changes no oh yeah and we're <laughs> off and she you, goes. you have to go outside the u.s to do it i, I can introduce you to that check out the, the podcast it's yeah, the human yeah. upgrade is, is what it's called well that's another yeah. thing yeah so that's the name of my show. We've had 1,100 episodes now. And wow. you, you haven't been on, have you? No. That's I'm ridiculous. Ready. All right, well, then we'll fix that. I'll, I'll do an episode with you. And you know, we'll talk about all the stuff you're doing. And we have it we'll do that when, you're, when, you're, <laughs> when is your book coming out? I know I wrote the uh, uh, January 14th. Jan- okay, so let's do it so that we have you on to talk about your book. Because that'll help. I've helped a lot of people at the New York Times list with the show, so that'd be Aww. awesome. Okay, we'll do that. 
Oh, yeah. It's easy. Mm, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much. You're worth it. <laughs> okay, and what else is... <laughs> You can feel your feelings, Aggie. <laughs> See, that's 40 years of Zen. I'm connected to my feelings. You are. But no, but thank you. You're welcome. It's, it's truly, it's my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what else? <laughs> Not that I'm trying to get myself distracted. But uh, no, what else but have I working on? Oh, no, gene therapy we were talking about. Yes. So, the average person gets 90 He's like, <laughs> he's he's like, like are, are you, you okay? <laughs> mommy, are you okay? Okay. <laughs> he made me cry. Go kill. <laughs> We've been trying to train him to kill people and yeah, nothing. I don't. I don't get that personality vibe here. It's no, like, he might come and kiss you. So, so gene therapy. Gene therapy. I was like, when do you have time to learn all this? Like, you know everything about everything, and I'm just like, I find it so hard to be always. Okay. keeping track it's so many new things you stop reading for two weeks and you're like oh shit like five new things came up <laughs> when i was 26 i started running this anti-aging group run by people in their 80s i had distilled wisdom from the masters from the generation and the generation before me and they taught it to me in a, in a concise way and then i have 1100 episodes of the podcast and 3000 articles and eight books about half of the new york times bestsellers and i've read tens of thousands of papers on pubmed and so all of that together means that um i have a really good picture in my head of how things work and people come to me and they bring me the coolest new stuff because they know i'm going to be interested and that i want to talk about it so i'm so grateful that the good stuff just shows up yeah right beautiful and just such yeah. a beautiful metaphor in life that if you are clear with what's important to you. The world provides, yeah. the player provides in a way, right? Like yeah. in, in things fact, keep on coming. For the gene therapy, three different people uh, who I know and respect each texted me independently and said that I should, uh, I should talk to this guy. I'm like, okay, I'll do that, right? And so I did, I was, oh, this is really good. And as soon as I did that, it turns out that uh, one of my good friends in Austin I had just done gene therapy and I ran into her at the customs um, like baggage claim in Miami of all places. And she's like, I just got back from doing gene therapy. Like, what the hell? It's popping up in my life everywhere. Yeah, so the good stuff just shows up. Yeah. Right. That's part of it. And then I, I read. Right. But it's very weird. And you're, you're getting there. Um, when you have your, your finger on the pulse of something, there's a just knowing that happens. And that happens when you get out of your head and you allow stuff to just come so that's beautiful how. dave thank you so much for coming on the show you're welcome Abby. for making me cry making me laugh and and just being such a such a beautiful example of what it's like to to you know biohack your mind your soul and and just you know remembering that biohacking is a a way for us to just live a better life it's not the end goal in itself so not at all it's not the end goal end goal to be happy have all the energy you want for as long as you want. And if you do those things, it'll be a good life. Amazing. Thank you. You're welcome.